All right, so this talk is on repetitio, a classical school, and how it plays out in the math curriculum. All right, I've had math teachers tell me that if they were to ask a typical student these days to divide 136 by 8, the kid, having been taught to do so, would reach for his calculator. Just give me a, ball car a ballpark guess. Nope, the kid doesn't even know where to start. But a kid who's been given years of number sense practice, he knows mentally how to break this problem down because we've taught him. He knows that you can think of this as 80 and 56. And those two numbers, you can divide very easily by eight, right? Just 10 and seven, 17. It takes, you know, I mean, I'm not that smart. It would take me a couple of seconds to figure this one out, all right? Uh, so he's been trained to recognize how to make combinations of these numbers to fit that kind of a, you know, he knows these relationships. And what I'm going to show you now is how does he get that number sense? Because um, explaining it actually takes longer than just doing it. It's really a couple of seconds. Now, a calculator could get there, yes, but by the time you pull the calculator out and you punch in the numbers and all of that, you know, whatever, we've left you in the dust. Um, <laughs> but worse, relying on calculators, by relying on calculators, Kids have been deprived of a concrete experience with numbers and their relationships to each other, and this means trouble down the road. When you simply punch numbers, which are abstract symbols, into a calculator, and you get another abstract number out, it's an abstraction. There's no process there that makes it concrete. There's no way of understanding what makes it true. Mathematical intuition, it comes from repeated, concrete applications. The mathematicians in my life they tell me there's no real substitute for that. So take the number 57, okay? You look at a pile of 57 marbles. You can't say that's 57. It's an abstraction. You can't do it. The only way you can get there is by counting it, by doing something experiential. Or you can estimate it because you understand that in 57, there are a certain number of maybe groups of five. You know, there's like 11 groups of five, and you can sort of see a group of five because that's a number that you can sort of you know, you do have direct intuition with that. Um, so we do teach calculators in post-algebraic mathematics. Calculators are useful tools. We spend a whole year teaching pre-calc students how to use graphing calculators in great detail. But calculators have to be used for the right tasks, not to rob kids of mental exercises that they absolutely need to internalize mathematical operations, okay? So math, it's an, and this is a definition I got, you know, out of the dictionary, it's an abstract study of properties such as quantity, structure, change. And for kids at this age, at the grammar stage, the more we can relate those abstractions to concrete reality, the more easily they'll be able to move to the kind of abstract thinking that mathematics requires in the dialectic stage. So this is sort of sounding like what I was saying back here, but now I'm going to show you how to do it with uh, these repetitio drills. So I want to give you three examples out of many that um, move mathematical abstractions into the realm of reality. So time, weather, and money. Now probably your kids at some point or another have done some of these exercises at their schools or wherever they are. But we do them every day, and we do them quickly, and we do them regularly. And in doing them the way we do them, the kids get sort of ever-increasing agility, dexterity with numerical symbols and operations. So first, calendar math. At the beginning of every month, every kid gets a blank calendar. And on the first day of the month, we write the number one. Okay? And this is, you know, this is for our really little kids. The second day, we write the number two. The third day, we write the number three. And so forth and so on. And every day, we ask a series of increasingly challenging questions that gets the kids relating these mathematical abstractions with concrete applications. So for example, what was yesterday's date? What is today's? What is tomorrow's? How many days till Friday? How many days since Monday? How many weeks until Easter? You see, I put a little Easter, you know, I have my kids do this. They draw these little symbols so that we have sort of targets to shoot for. How many days is that? How many weeks is that? Well, if it's two weeks, how many days is that? You know, multiplication. Most, so at this point, what we're basically doing, you know, if, if, you, if you look in a textbook, math textbook, you'll see number line exercises. Well, these are basically number line exercises, okay? But they're real. They're concrete. Um, 
They're giving the kids concrete experience doing arithmetic operations in a very real way. All right, so weather, this is what Kim was talking about, the weather math. The little kids, what they do is they fill in a weather symbol for the day. Sunny, partly sunny, cloudy, rainy, snowy. To, and then they create a bar chart. They get a new, a fresh one of these every month. So how many sunny days have we had this month? Zero, right? <laughs> no, maybe one. <laughs> maybe one. But you can see, you know, like if they look out the window and they see the sun, they'd put a little sun here. You know, and then now this day, it's, they put a cloud. Oh, they put another cloud. Since it's Wisconsin, let's put another. Yeah, right, exactly. You know, rain, 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 you know, et cetera. So by the time the month is over, you know, you can really talk about the math here. Um, how many sunny days have we had this month? How many rainy days? How many cloudy days? What kind of weather have we had most often? How about least often? Um, so it's just helping them visualize you know, quantities and that sort of thing. And it's helping them with comparisons and with greater than, less than, that sort of thing. Um, oh, I don't need to turn the page. We've got one more to do here. I'm sorry. Um, older students then do a, so this is a, this is a bar chart. O older students do a line chart. They do it with temperature. They plot each day's temperature on the line graph. So, you know, you start off here, you're here, you're here, then you're here, then you're up here, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, and we can, they're a little older now. They're like in third grade, second, third grade, and we're doing this. How many degrees did it rise yesterday? How many did it drop? So now we're starting to get a basis for positive and negative numbers. Okay, that's a hard thing for kids to deal with, positive and negative numbers. How much colder is it? Now, when the kid has been playing around with this thing, this going up and down and positive differences and that sort of thing, you'd be surprised how much easier it is to be able to teach the difference between a number and the absolute value of a number. So between a number that has a direction and a number that just expresses a distance. So those of you who are math teachers, you know how hard this is for kids to get. But the idea is, you know, when, you're, when you are doing a concrete thing like this, it just makes abstract ideas just so much easier to teach them and then finally money math and like I said the, these three examples money calendar time uh, there's a million of these I just picked three of them um, American coinage is perfect for teaching place value and that's a key to sort of a, uh, arithmetic operations we have them trade pennies in for dimes dimes in for dollars so they're doing carrying and borrowing long before they're ready to start actually doing it like longhand you know, they're actually doing it mentally by playing around with the, the coins. And then there are other great things you can do with money. You just grab a thing of coins. How much money do I have in my hand? Or this is a hugely useful one, um, and that is change for a dollar. I'm buying this marker. It's 35 cents. Give me change for a dollar. Now, And you do this every day. You know, you do this every day. And having, like, the change for a dollar thing, having all of the numbers, the, the combinations of numbers that add up to 100, that, again, is just really a wonderful skill for kids to have. Um, so, again, doing these things every day, it just grounds the students in these concrete examples uh, via the classical two of repetitio. So th that's sort of the concrete stuff. Now, now I want to get to the more abstract number drills um, that we also do sort of every day. Uh, we run the kids through very carefully designed drills that just, again, build mental arithmetic agility. And these vary by grade level, but let me just give you here some examples. So we have these stacks of cards for uh, addition and subtraction and then multiplication and division. And we teach these in groups. So first of all, like the blue would be all the numbers when you add one, you know, so one plus one, two plus one, three plus one, four plus one, five plus one, okay? And then we'd maybe do the doubles, four plus four, five plus five, six plus six, seven plus seven. So the idea is by learning these things in these groups, you know, they're able to sort of apply the same kind of thinking to each one. And then maybe we would do fact families, you know, seven and eight and 15, that's a fact family. Those, have, those numbers have relationships with each other. So we teach them these in a group. So you're not just sitting down sort of learning your math tables, just completely isolated from each other. You're trying to group the problems together. Um, and what, what our goal is, is to just bring a student to total mastery of single digit addition and subtraction. Because, you know, those of you who are not teachers, you have no idea what a disaster it is when a student in the upper grades doesn't have perfect agility with single digit addition and subtraction when he tries to do multiple digit operations. It's, it's uh, you know, we want, the, we want him to be quick on this. And then multiplication, 
Well, here's how we do this. If you start every math class in kindergarten and first grade with skip counting, by the time they start multiple multiplication tables in second grade, they've already got this innate sense that multiplication, it's really just sequential addition. And kids can, you know, again, get them outside. They can skip count on the trampoline, on the playground, from one end of the classroom to the other. So like, and for those of you who don't know what skip counting is, it's just 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, and then doing it backwards, 20, 18, 16, 14, 12, 10, 8, 6, I don't do it as quickly, 4, 2. And then, you know, <laughs> Uh, now, for, for the twos, it may seem like, okay, yeah, whatever. But, you know, think of it for the sevens. And again, we're doing sequential addition, but that's really multiplication. 7, 14, 21, 28, 35, 42, 49, 56, 63, 70. You know, now do it backwards. And have them be doing this and this and whoa. And just, you know, ha have them all over the place as they do this. Use the trampoline. Go outside and have them run. Um, if, they're, if they're doing counting by tens to 100, fives to 50, they're skip counting other patterns like squares. This is, a, this is the square pattern, you know, 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, et cetera, 36, 49, 64, 81. Have them do those too and have them do them backwards. Um, just look for those patterns in, that are going to set them up for total success with the multiplication tables. And give them the mnemonics. Um, I didn't write this down, but like the nines, you know, 9, 18, 27, 36, 45, the digits of the multiples of nine, they add up to multiples of three. You know, so show them that stuff. I mean, it's, it's not only is it cool, but then it's, it's a great mnemonic, which is a sort of an aid to memory. Um, so when you first throw seven times six at a student, he's already got the battle won because he's been doing this for a couple of years now. So multiplication problem, tables become no problem. Now, equally important are the written. So that's all done mostly orally. The written speed drills that we do, those are sets that sort of emphasize patterns that give kids even greater facility with numerical manipulation. Um, so I'm going to give you a couple examples here. Like this, and this is what they look like, the cards that, that I use. They're sets of 20, and they're just patterns of um, arithmetic manipulation. So I'm, again, let me just explain, like, for example, how this one works. You know, this looks like a horrendous arithmetic problem. But what we do is we just say, okay, look, just round this up. This is 300. This is 200. It's going to be very close to 500, right? Well, except you're a little short here by one. You're a little short here by two. So just take away three and then you're good. So it's, you know, 497. It's just very easy to see. And then, you know, so this is really, it's 300 plus 400. It's going to be almost 700, but really it's five short. So it's 695. So, um, this particular drill, obviously, it teaches kids to round up or down and then to compensate after you've carried out the operation. Now imagine, like this is drill card 133. I just grabbed one from piles of these things. Imagine hundreds of these things, each focusing on a different pattern. This was just one pattern, one little trick out of hundreds of tricks on how to do addition. Um, so in addition to these drills, we're also teaching now, th this is a sort of a written thing, but we're also teaching mental math strategies. Um, students' mathematical agility greatly increases when they're doing daily work with mental strategies in their heads, where we don't want them to write it down. So for example, you might give this to a kid in second grade or whatever, and it might look like a sort of a scary problem, but you give them a technique. Because they've, with the money math, they've had so much practice figuring out sums to 100, they can quickly see that it takes 21 to get to 200, right? And then it takes another 37 to get to 237. So 21 and 37 is what, 58? Did I do that right? I think I did that right. Um, so the subtraction is just going to be the difference. So you just start here, jump up to the next 100, and then go here, and then you just add those two together. And again, that takes a lot longer to explain than it actually takes to do it. And it's just a strategy. You know, it's just a strategy that you give them on a pattern of numbers. Um, and here's another example. It's This is a division strategy. So here, dividing by two, how to do that mentally. I don't know, this may be first grade, second grade. 118 divided by two, you just break this up, 118. It's just 50 and 9, so it's 59. Or here, you know, the 300, the 50, the 8, it's 150. 50 divided by 2 is 25, so you're up to 175. 
This divided by two is four, so you're up to 179. So, and again, it takes a lot longer to say than it does to actually do. So this is another just pattern of drill that you're gonna give your kids. And if you build mathematical agility on a daily basis, you know, in all these ways that I've described, uh, and this is before we're even starting the actual lesson. This is just our, our warm up. Um, I, can, I can promise you, they're gonna be pretty agile with math by the time they get to the, you know, the upper levels where they really have to start abstracting. Now the words drill and repetition and memory, they have not always been popular in modern American education, but again, the repetitio mater studiorum est, repetition is the mother of learning. And it's the repetition that makes this exercise worthwhile. Um, studies show that when you break down information into these little chunks, you drill them regularly, you're optimizing the brain's retention, you're speeding up the brain's acquisition rate, which is you know, how fast we can acquire new information. And we're laying a foundation for more abstract mathematical thinking down the road, which increases our capacity.